Okay, I think we can start. My name, uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mariusz Zaborski, and my presentation will be about Capsicum and Casper, and in general about some of the Sandboxes frameworks. Uh, we will be discussing the problems which the Sandboxes try to solve, and also the problems which they create. So, like I mentioned, my name is Mariusz Zaborski. I work on, uh, at Wheel Systems Company. We are doing uh, cool stuff there. For, we have uh, two uh, pretty uh, fun uh, appliances, one of which is uh, TLS and um, SSL decryptor, and second is for uh, monitor uh, privilege user sessions. And I'm also a FreeBSD committer from at least one year. So the plan is, first we will discuss, uh, do we need sandbox at all? Maybe we don't need a sandbox and we just can go to home and everything is fine. Uh, we will be discussing a few, uh, few uh, sandbox methods like SecCom, Pledge, and Capsicum. Then we will be discussing two, uh, two very interesting proje projects, which was built around the Caps, uh, Capsicum, Cloud ABI, and Casper. So I'm working mostly on security, and as you can see, uh, uh, working in security area is really, really dangerous place to work right now. <laughs> so let's start. So do we need a sandbox? Um, let's think about um, some program, very simple program like, for example, CAT. If we would find a buffer overflow or any other vulnerability in that program, we would gain access to all our data. Uh, attacker would gain access to all our data. He can read our emails, he would uh, see all our photos, he could even send those photos uh, over the internet. Uh, he could, for example, start SSHD and log into our uh, computer and so on and so on. Every time when we are talking about um, such access, uh, unauthorized access, when a program has access to every other data without any control, we are talking about ambient authority. So do we fight with ambient authority? Not only, we are also trying to um, just mitigate the problems, like we are trying to solve some problems with um, different techniques. For example, we develop NX uh, bits, which are a special bits in, uh, which you can send uh, on the um, memory page, which says that this part of memory cannot be executable. And we were trying to, to mitigate in this way um, buffer overflows and vulnerabilities. But uh, when we did that, the researchers came out with so-called return-oriented programming, which bas basically means that we are looking for some parts of codes, so-called gadgets, in um, other parts of memory, and we build from that our exploit. So mitigation techniques are fine, we should have them, but they not solve our problems. They make it only harder to exploit them. So uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Genval Conwind and Mateusz Jurczyk, did a very interesting uh, test of a few of the uh, popular uh, programs. And just by fusing, so uh, fusing is technique where you are take up some blob of the valid data, which program understand and start to change randomly some, some data there. Only by that, they found like one, over 1,000 bugs in FMPG. FMPG, if you don't know, it's a very popular um, video codec. Uh, so only by fuzzing they found over 1,000 bugs. That means that uh, all of the, those bugs was fixed and uh, I don't feel secure running FMPG on my computer just on bare, uh, bare operating system because if it has so much in so simple uh, way, um, bugs, in finding some simple way, how many does it have at all? Or even if it has like 100 bugs fixes, I'm wondering how many new bug fi uh, bugs were uh, created while they was fixed. 
So I hope I convinced you a little bit that we need uh, sandboxes and they solve some of our problems. So we will look at one of the oldest uh, sandbox, which is called SecComp. It was developed for Linux. Uh, so SecComp has two, two uh, types. Uh, you can run a SecComp in two different modules. One of them is called a strict module, which allow you for very, very uh, little count of syscalls, like read, write, exit. And so when you enter such sandbox, you don't have, you cannot do a lot of uh, with that. In other hand, we have a filter mode, which allows you to define which syscalls in your operating system are uh, allowed. And even it's uh, allow you to define which arguments for the syscall are allowed or not. So this is example of using uh, seccomp. Uh, it's an example from SSHD. As you can see, I truncated it even because there was a lot of, a lot of more. It's not easy to use that, and uh, there are probably also a lot of, uh, you can do a lot of mistakes while developing such, uh, using such sandbox. And also you need to maintain all this uh, list of uh, sister tellers which are allowed or um, disallow it in your uh, program. So uh, developers came out with libsepcomp, which uh, simplifies a little bit the uh, usage of uh, seccomp, but it's still, uh, but it's still you need to uh, maintain all those rules. So uh, seccomp is very, very popular use that it was developed in 2005, so it has a lot of time to, to be widely used. For example, it's used in Chrome or Firefox. So one of the most recently work was uh, done in OpenBSD. It's called the so-called Pledge. And Pledge is, in my opinion, very uh, similar to, to SecCom. The difference is that you don't get, uh, you don't need to define all those filters. The authors of Pledge did define them for you. They just um, you just use one of uh, one of filters that they give you, or multiple of filters. So uh, the idea behind uh, Pledge was that every program, every uh, program, you can uh, divide into two parts: one which is called initialization phase, and second which is the main loop. The in in its initialization phase, you are just initializing data that you need. So you open some files, you're preparing the environment, and so on and so on. And after this phase, there is main loop, which are you doing every and um, more complicated or less complicated uh, things in that. Um, so Pledge has very simple uh, interface. You can just, um, you just put the, um, put the promises, how they called it, into the syscall, and you are in the sandbox. And any other um, syscalls which are not in those promises are done it. They also, uh, in their um, interface, they also had um, proposed the white path argument, which is right now not implemented. But the idea behind that is if you uh, define some white path uh, in this uh, uh, pledge call, you cannot uh, you can access those files. Uh, but like like I uh, what, like uh, like I said before, it's still not implemented. Uh, one of uh, uh, how authors like to to mention very often, uh, pledge is used in over four hundred programs, so it's used quite widely in OpenBSD projects. So we have like 25 promises. Uh, STDIO, for example, which is very, very popular because it allows you some basic uh, operations in your operating system. Uh, it also gives you the uh, end uh, error path, which allows you to uh, read only all your data, or data on the disk. 
uh, others two very interesting uh, promises is inet which allows you to open uh, open the um, sockets to the um, servers connect uh, accept the the connection from from others and uh, this is one which i would like you, you to remember for a moment and other uh, promises is prods and exits which allows you to fork and then execute some program and this also i would like to uh, i would like that you remember them for for a moment so this is how the pledge is used in cat and uh, as you can see it's very easy to use you just need to analyze which which uh, promises the the program need so cat is very simple it just need um, some allocations this is why this is the io promises and it also needs some access to our disk this is why the airpath uh, promises and this program is uh, sandboxes pretty well we we cannot for example read we can read arbitrary files from if we would find some some uh, vulnerability in cat but uh, we cannot do a lot of that uh, uh, a lot of more we can read we cannot send those data we cannot overwrite this data everything looks fine so the, here is also the the list of some of the bigger programs which are using pledge we can see even x servers on the list or syslogd but pledge unfortunately have some issue one of them which is very annoying that if you use prods and exec uh, comment uh, promises, then you are started a new process without the sandbox. So you just escape from the sandbox, right? This not feel right, in my opinion. Other things is hard coded paths in kernel. Um, there are a lot of them, which allows you, for example, um, open files like etc local time or read link from etc uh, malloc conf and this is also a little bit um, tricky because if you would like to use um, other library for example for time zones or, or other uh, malloc library and it would need to use some other files than those then you need to patch the kernel to, to use them otherwise maybe instead of doing that maybe uh, you could do the white paths uh, argument but it's still not implemented so you don't have any other choice right now and i'm not sure if one template is enough for for doing all the programs around the operating system um, for example we can imagine i don't know um, a mail program which needs to read all our files on the on the disk so we need to air path promises he need to write some files on our disk so he need a, a vpath uh, promises and now we are a little bit in problem because it also need to connect to the server to read data on from the server right so we could do that in initialization phase and everything works fine but what if we lose this connection we need to reconnect to this uh, program right to the server so we have two choices or we will leave these uh, premises which allows us to uh, to uh, connect to the random servers or we will do the exec and prods uh, solutions which allows us to escape from the sandbox so we have some some uh, some sandbox techniques but as you can see it's not allow us it's not done it as from from example which I give with uh, with um, CAD that we can still read all our data from the disk and send them over over the internet and uh, I didn't mention that uh, the the the, um, the pledge is used in over 400 programs but even uh, every fourth program so around 100 programs are using the exit and paths uh, um, promises so in my opinion all the 100 programs are not secure and also we need to consider that uh, some of the uh, combinations of, of uh, promises also don't guarantee us any secure okay 
So now we will discuss a little bit capsicum. So capsicum, we can divide into two, uh, two, um, two parts. One of them is a tiny sandbox. When, so when you are running the cap enter, which is the Cisco which uh, enables the sandbox, you don't have access to any global namespaces. You cannot read from the file, uh, read from the disk. You cannot uh, see other programs. You cannot enter to jail. You cannot see a jails, and so on and so on. You don't have access to any other global namespace. And another part of uh, Capsicum is capability, right? So um, when Capsicum was developed, the authors um, seen that file descriptors are pretty good at uh, manage, managing uh, the uh, write. So they add, a, uh, they add uh, additional layer, layer to uh, be able to even more um, limit the descriptors. So we have in uh, Capsicum around 80 capabilities, right, which are per descriptor. And you can say, for example, that this descriptor for example, the log descriptor, the, the descriptor which is the, the descriptor to the file with log, is open only. That means that even if uh, attacker would uh, break our uh, break to our process, it still don't have access. Uh, he cannot uh, jump to the file and de delete, for example, the the line which saying that something malicious was on the on our program. Uh, so we can have more standard also uh, write lab, like cap read or cap write, which says just that from this descriptor we can only uh, read or we can only write. So in Capsicum we have two different ways to obtain more uh, capabilities, or in general get some capabilities. One of them is to in, uh, do this in the initialization phase. That means before similar in pledge like in pledge if uh, we um, before entering the sandbox we just open the files we open the the, um, the connection that we need and so on and so on other uh, method is by delegation but first I will show you how the uh, capsicum uh, can be used with with uh, initialization phase so here we have example uh, how the unique uh, program is uh, is uh, sandbox. But as you can see, it's a little bit harder than, than in Pledge, but uh, we have here uh, limited the, our um, descriptors. Uh, one of them is basically we first uh, check which um, argument we should limit, or this is as to the IO, or it's we should open some some arc file descriptor. We limit this uh, descriptor, and then we just enter to, to capability mode. As you can see, also we check uh, in special way the error value because uh, we can have uh, Capsicum compiled in the kernel or not. It just uh, we just need to check if error is uh, uh, NOSIS, and if it's not, that means that uh, some other uh, some other error. Like, uh, was okay. So, other example of getting uh, more um, rights in in sandboxed um, process is by using delegation. So, we can have some more uh, privilege uh, process, which has right to some resources. For example, he can read from from file system, or he can um, resolve DNS, or he have connection to, to data, database, and so on and so on. And we need to, uh, then we, for, for example, connect to this such process, or we fork from this process, and uh, we need to establish some um, IPC between those processes. For example, we say that uh, this process, uh, when I send you this message, you should return me this, or this, or this. This, uh, this reduces our TCB because the main problem, the main, uh, the main algorithm, the, the most complicated algorithm, for example, uh, Hodex or whatever, is still ru running in the sandbox. But the simplest task, like giving me the next descriptor to the file or giving me uh, some data from the database, 
is still done in privilege, uh, in a privilege uh, process. So by this, we just uh, reduce the TCB that, uh, that, that we need to very careful check. So Capsicum uh, is, used, is not used very widely, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it is used in few of the base uh, system tools, like uh, before mentioned Unix or, or TCB dump. Uh, it's also used in our package system. And we also have a, a patch for, for Chromium to sandbox. Uh, yeah, but package is also not in base. I mean, few of them and and, and then, okay. Uh, let's go. So, unfortunately, uh, Capsicum also have some, some issues. Uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, it's very, um, it has very high barriers to enter. You need to know a lot of things before you enter. You need to know how, um, how the script, what are the scripts, how they work. Uh, you need to know maybe if you are doing the uh, privilege, uh, the, if you're doing the delegation, you need to know how to manage the uh, IPC and so on and so on. So it's a little bit harder to start, but uh, and unfortunately also it uh, has um, some troubles, for example, with libc. It, uh, a lot of uh, libc function is not allowed in in, uh, in capability mode, and it's hard sometimes to see at first that this function you cannot do in uh, in Capsicum. Maybe you need to um, change the architecture of, of of your program or do it some some uh, somehow else. Um, and also, uh, some third libraries also are not helpful, uh, not helping you because. If they're using some global namespace, you need to know that. Probably you need to go to source code, see if, that's, uh, if this library is doing something fancy. Maybe uh, change this in the library, or, um, or maybe you need to, again, uh, do the delegation thing. And we also, in Capsicum, sometimes use some, some funny magic calls. Uh, for example, here with, with local time uh, and time, which basically means if you first call local time, it's cached the at its local time dot com file. So if you first run the local time before entering the capability mode, you fetch the file, and you can then in capability mode use multiple uh, t uh, local time multiple times. Unfortunately, you need to do this uh, call before uh, before entering the uh, capability mode. So Capsicum is a very, very uh, interesting uh, framework. Uh, it has some issue, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, it's sometimes hard to, to use it in, in uh, programs that are already, uh, which are already implemented. Uh, Capsicum is very beautiful uh, and very easy to write when you um, design all the program from, from beginning to use that Capsicum, to use Capsicum. Okay. So like I mentioned before in Capsicum, all we are, are trying to do is to, uh, to minimize, minimize the part of TCB that you need to uh, review in a secure way, that you need to be sure that this part is, uh, is quite secure. This is what we are trying to accomplish. Okay, so now I will tell you a little bit about Cloud ABI, uh, which is a kind of new thing. Uh, I believe it has um, two years, maybe. So Cloud ABI is designed for cloud. How its name is... Uh, uh, so... Uh, the idea behind Cloud ABI is that you can take some arbitrary uh, binary, which you would compile before, and put it to the server. And all the things which this binary is doing is in, uh, it's in capability mode. So uh, the, the files which are created in, in uh, Cloud ABI are cross, 
from our uh, cross platform. So you can took, for example, some binary which was compiled on Linux, go to the FreeBSD and run it with, with Cloud ABI. Uh, so first thing of Cloud ABI is that he has like special uh, running environment. He has special Cloud ABI run, and then we gave some uh, binary which we want to g give it, and then we give a special YAM fi file which describes uh, what this environment uh, should prepare for our program. It should, if it should open, uh, here is the list of the, what uh, YAM files is supported. If uh, it should, for example, open as some socket, or if it, sh it should open as some um, directory, or maybe some file, and so on and so on. This all things can be defined in, in this YAM file. So, um, the second part of cloud, cloud ABI is the new libc or so-called cloud libc, which removes all not capability-friendly uh, func functions like open or uh, stats or wait and so on, and allows only the capability-friendly functions like PD, PD wait or uh, or um, on open app. It's also remove all functions which are considered unsecure. For example, STR uh, CPY, uh, uh, which uh, just copy the, the, the data without uh, checking the, the uh, length of it. So all those, those uh, files are, are uh, removed, and which we gain from that, uh, all functions was removed, and which, what we gain from that is that when we are compiling our our uh, binary, we get um, compilations errors that if if this function in our program is not capsicum friendly. So for example, if you would use in our program OpenSSL or something similar, and this OpenSSL opens, for example, def random, and it's not allowed in, in uh, capsicum, it's not allowed in capsicum, we would get a, um, error uh, while compilation time. When in normal capsicum without Cloud ABI and in Pledge or, or SecCom or whatever, all the different sandbox, we don't have that. We just need to wait when the code will be executed and check if it's fail or not fail or maybe it works. Okay, so Casper was my recent work, which I was, uh, which I was spending a lot of time on. So, uh, basic idea of Casper is to provide an API which is uh, sandbox friendly. So we are preparing the functions which will delegate for you some tasks uh, to to external process. So if you want, for example, resolve DNS or open some files, you can ask Casper for do that for you. You don't need to create a separate process because uh, it's, it's very common, for example, that you need to implement DNS service to, to resolve the DNS. A lot of program needs that. So Casper is trying to do that for you. So uh, first implementation was the daemon approach. Uh, it was Casper D. We was using libnv as EPC. It wasn't changed uh, later. Um, it's divided in four. It was divided in uh, four uh, parts. One was the services, which I mentioned that, uh, which are uh, the implementation of all this uh, uh, resolving or open files, the, the task that should be done for you. Uh, there was a, a Casper file in etc which uh, provides the list of services which was available in operating system. Uh, we had libcapsicum, uh, which was just EPC to communicate with, with Casper. And we had libcasper, which was the library which was used by services to implement uh, the functionality. So the... Uh, the approach which, which was taken was that Casper D would start with the operating system. It would fork first to create so-called Zygot. It should be. It was 
a very lightweight process. It, ha it didn't use a lot of memory. It uh, didn't have uh, open any descriptors and so on and so on. It, it uh, was done to be very quickly to, to fork from it again. So if process needs some, uh, if process needs some, uh, some services, then it's using uh, Unix domain socket, it could connect to the Casper and ask for some services. Then Casper will fork the zygot and translate one of those uh, zygots to the service and then pass the service to, to, the, pro uh, to the process and Casper could wait for another, another program to, to, to another process to connect and try uh, ask for another service. This approach, unfortunately, had a lot of, a lot of different uh, issues. For example, uh, Casper was started in, uh, at the beginning of the, pro uh, on the system and it was because that he was, uh, um, he, he could be run from, uh, so it was started from in the beginning of the, uh, operate, uh, on the start of the system, operating system, and we could have uh, two approaches, or he could be running as root, or he could run as a special um, Casper D user or, or whatever. Because we didn't know which uh, process, uh, the process which would connect to the Casper is from the user A, B, or, or some, uh, some other user. We couldn't know that. So uh, we had a different credentials. This was easy solved uh, because we could send in secure way the credentials by, um, by uh, Unix domain socket and then use set wid and set git functions to, to change those permissions. This, this issue uh, was solved. And unfortunately, other, uh, other problems wasn't solved so easy. For example, the resource limits if, or, uh, or working directory. When, when Casper was started, it was running from the root. The program was in the different di run in the different directory. If you try to open the file, for example, name it uh, uh, mails or, or whatever, it will try to open the file in the root directory, not in your directory. Or different Mac, lab Mac labels and uh, different humans. These all things should be synchronized between the process and uh, with uh, the uh, Casper daemon. Uh, other issue, CPU set. If you said that grep should work only on this CPU, yeah, it would work, but Casper would work on different CPU. You couldn't limit the Casper that way. Um, very interesting problem is with so-called so-called um, so uh, process subst substitution, which is uh, available in shell. When you uh, use special um, syntax, you can pass to the program uh, the descriptor to the data that you want to read. So if you would do open of uh, in the directory like div fd something 345, you will just duplicate the descriptor which was passed to you, uh, uh, which was passed to you uh, by the shell. So here we have example with div. If we would do the cat A and cat B, the data would be on the descriptor 11 and uh, descriptor 14. When you just open them, you would duplicate it, that descriptor and use those. If you delegate such, uh, such path to the Casper, he don't know those descriptors, right? He, he was running from the different process. He didn't know uh, what the descriptor 11 and 14 is, or he could know and you would leak some, some private uh, Casper data. And that's not all. You also could uh, change the routing table per process, which means that for you want to say that uh, this TCP dump should use this routing table. And when Casper would, uh, and Casper of course would not use that because it was running from the different process, he didn't know that. And uh, uh, if you, you for example would, um, uh, would send Casper uh, you would ask Casper to, to resolve DNS for you or, or doing other stuff, he will not respect this routing, uh, routing table. Uh, because that uh, we had a different, uh, different uh, 
process which wasn't connected, the only connection was the Unix domain socket, it was very hard to audit or key trace such, such communication between uh, such, uh, such uh, process. And of course, there was one point of failure. If, if, if Casper D would fail in your operating system, then you would uh, most likely not use Sandbox. And you, if you, maybe you will not even not notice that Casper will not, uh, is not working. And for example, for months, you would not use Casper and Sandbox at all. So one of the solution which was proposed to do that is to make some special system call or make some special flags to Unix domain sockets which allow you to copy all of the uh, of those credentials, all of the, of the settings from one process to another process. Maybe it should be allowed only by root, uh, but uh, this also didn't solve all our, our um, problem. We would need to send also the descriptor tables we, and so on. So this was one of the uh, solution which was proposed. We didn't go that way. We uh, did go in other direction. And before I describe the new solution, I also would like to tell you a little bit about process descriptors. So process descriptors were also created uh, around the capsicum. And the main idea behind process descriptors is that you, when you fork, you not only get the PID to the process, but you also get the descriptors to this process. So you can, for example, KQ, pull, or select on this process and wait when this uh, process will fail or, or, um, or other stuff. And uh, there, there, there is also plan to, to implement a tether weight, which will just wait on this, uh, in this particular uh, descriptor, but what is, the most interesting in, in this for us is that if you, and uh, this uh, process descriptor are of course uh, capsicum friendly because you are using descriptor, you are not using the global PID table, so you can watch the process, what you, uh, how, uh, what he's doing. Uh, what is very interesting is that if wait was called in your program with the minus one argument, which means I don't care which the child of mine will fail or, or give some other signal. I don't care, I just want to fetch the first, uh, first uh, child that uh, will fail. The PD fork will not, uh, the, the uh, process with process descriptor will not be uh, in this group. If the process, the process with the process descriptor would fail, it will not uh, be noticed by, by wait process. Of course, if you're using wait with the, uh, with the PID, which was given by, uh, while forking, uh, you can still do that. So the new architecture was to, uh, we changed the architecture and we uh, decided to fork from the actual process, not like before uh, connecting to the dem daemon. We also reduced from a few of the, um, uh, few of the libraries we now have just libcasper, which is the EPC between Casper and, uh, and services, and we have just services. We, now, if you want to use uh, some, sorry, if you want to use some Casper services, you need to link them to them, sorry, to the uh, library. And what, what is very interesting also, API didn't uh, change at all. Uh, and uh, we managed to um, manage to uh, solve all of the problems which I described with the previous uh, previous approach. Now, if you fork from the the same uh, process, you have the same credentials, you 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 have the same uh, MAC labels, and so on and so on and so on. One of the things is that if you call the cap init with uh, forks uh, which create the Casper, it will, if you do that, you cannot change your settings because it will not be propagated to the other, uh, other uh, process. But uh, this is the limit we, which we can accept for now. And uh, before you could 
disable Casper in uh, globally. If you didn't want Casper, you just uh, go to the uh, services and disable it, and then you would use the process without the CAPC command Casper. Uh, now you don't have that choice. You can change that by uh, recompiling your binary and disable Casper. So now we start from the process. So if you need, if process need Casper, it's just call cap init. Then Casper is uh, forked. It also still use Zygos like like before. If uh, process needs some service, it's asking the Casper for that. He uh, he clones the zygote, he creates the service, he passes the uh, service to the process, and if Casper is no more uh, needed, it just uh, died. Uh, in this approach, we still have all the uh, flexibility which we had in, before, uh, in previous uh, approach. We still can go and uh, delegate, delegate Casper uh, at all to the another uh, service. So we can send Casper over Unix domain socket to the other process. So those are uh, actually uh, um, services in our operating system. For example, which I uh, mentioned before, uh, DNS services, which allows you to resolve uh, DNS. Uh, you can... Uh, or system random, which uh, provides you some uh, random uh, numbers or, or random buffers uh, to, to your process, uh, which is also very interesting. You can limit uh, Casper even further. That means that, for example, if you want to resolve uh, DNS only in IPv4, you can tell Casper to do that. If your program will try to resolve uh, in IPv6, Casper will not allow that. If you want, for example, um, resolve DNS only freebsd.org and freebsd.eu or whatever, then you also can tell Casper that those are the domains that you want to resolve, no others. So if you have, for example, your uh, mail application, you can define that uh, only this EMAP server can be resolved. So here is how the Casper is used. Uh, we need to, like I uh, mentioned before, we need to create first the Casper uh, instance by calling cap init. Then we open the system DNS service, which is done by cap service open. Then we can limit the service uh, by using cap DNS uh, type limit and cap DNS family limit. Uh, in this example, we are limiting, for example, only uh, to use uh, IPv4 and IPv6. And after that, we also need to change the call from get host by name to cap uh, get host by name. As you can see, the, the interface is very similar to the original. The difference is that uh, only the, the Casper connection. And as you can see here, or in this slide, you, all the time you need to do the special check. If, if I'm using Casper, am I compiled with Casper or am I not? If not, use the standard library. If, if you are using uh, Casper, then use this special call. So which I'm working now, and unfortunately I wasn't able to commit that to, to 11, is sleep Casper mock, which hides all uh, that into the library. So when you will call, call cap uh, get host by uh, name to, or get host by uh, other, it will just uh, know if you are compiled with uh, Casper or not. And inside the library, it will tell you, do this, uh, connect to the Casper or do the um, standard uh, function. So we will reduce the amount of work which, which is needed uh, to be done uh, to capsicumize the, the application. That said, uh, we have uh, still some, some ongoing work. Uh, we would like to lower the bar uh, which is needed to, to use Capsicum and Casper. Um, as you can see, we, you need to know a lot of things right now. You need to uh, 
now some al also some hacks, for example, which I presented before with local time, which uh, isn't very nicely. Uh, we also are working still on uh, system file system, uh, which allows you to access to uh, the file system namespace to open the files, to, to uh, create files and so on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I believe I implemented like two or three services like that uh, already. I believe Pavel done also at least one. Uh, but we have still a uh, performance issue like uh, which uh, came from the uh, libnv which we are using right now but we have a google summer of code student who is working on improving that and we also would like to improve auditing uh, for for casper because right now if you don't run the code you will not know uh, if uh, your function will fail or not and maybe we could do something more to, to provide you more information if the um, if this code will work or not. Okay, so thank you very much. Maybe there are some questions. If uh, I'm not sure if LLDB is uh, supporting now the uh, multi-process debugging or, or not. So basically, uh, if the debugger is, is uh, supporting the multi-process debugging, it's, it, it's fine. You just need to check which process you want to, to debug. Yes. It's in 11. 11. Yeah. Is there any example program in 11 that is? Everyone, every, everyone which are, uh, okay, maybe uh, not so everyone. Is there a uh, for this user? Right, so on this slide there was uh, 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 programs which are using uh, Capsicum, so CCP dump uh, and uh, KD dump, uh, and pink are using are using capsicum uh, casper and capsicum yes uh, pardon could you repeat um Pablo, do you remember because i i'm done no I would <coughs> I would also say that, but I'm I'm not sure. We would need to to check that to be to be one hundred percent sure. Are there any other questions? Yes. With the right. So basically, uh, it depend. Will, it will depends on which uh, library that you link. If you would link to the libcasper standard library, then you would. The, the libraries will know that you are linking to this library, so please use Casper. If you will link to the libcasper mock, then this means you don't want to real Casper and use just the normal instruction. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention, and see you guys.